Hey, welcome back to our study this week. We're looking at Titus 3, 1 through 2. And uh, we're talking about how Paul said to Titus, remind them. So what do they need to be reminded of? And he's got two things here right off the beginning, uh, right off the top. And that is remind them about how they should act towards the government and towards the other people that they know. And uh, so we're going to look at that. Today we're going to look at um, how, how, do you, how do you act towards government? Now, Paul has this in a couple different places, but here it's just briefly mentioned in the book of Titus. So the first thing he says that ought to be yielding to authority. Now there's authority in the church. We already talked about this. Christians are not anarchist, but we believe that God has instituted earthly authorities. We've already seen the idea of authority in the church throughout this letter. Paul, as an apostle, has authority. He has authority over Titus, who is not an apostle. Titus was given authority to help select elders for the church, so he had authority over the churches. In turn, the elders were to have authority over the individual churches in the different towns in Crete. So there was this hierarchy of authority. There's also authority in heaven. Paul speaks of the rulers and authorities in heaven in Ephesians 3.10. There are different spiritual beings that God created, and there is order and authority amongst them. This is not who Paul is addressing here. Though the words are similar, this is not who he's talking about. People are not subject to angels, and especially not demons. According to Hebrews 1.14, angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So no matter what people say, you know, angels and demons are not an authority over us. Hebrews tells us they were sent out, angels are sent out for our sake. And, you know, if the angels, the the uh, righteous angels, the, the pure angels are not over us in authority, then how can demons be that way? So no matter what you think about that, uh, they do not have authority. <clears throat> Satan doesn't have authority over you. He's powerful, he's strong, can do things, yes. But he doesn't have ultimate authority over you. Especially if you're in the church. If you're in the church, then Christ is your head. He is the one who's over you as, as your leader, <clears throat> as your chief, as your master. So there's that. Then there's also authority in the home. In a family there, where there are uh, a husband and wife and children, the husband has authority as the head of the family, followed by the wife and then the children. We see this in various places, including here in Titus. So you have the idea that the man is the head of the household. Um, of course, <clears throat> the household has to have a man. But that, as you know, no matter what the, the what the world is telling us today, it's like, oh, these are you know, every family is an equally Val equally um, not just valid but equally special. But um, the Bible makes it clear that the family ought to be a husband, a wife, and then the children. And the husband's the head, then the wife, and then come the children. Children are not in charge of the family; they don't have equal say in the family. And the wife is submissive; she has authority; she has power. But yet she's willingly submitting herself to her husband. And the husband is loving both his children and his wife, and giving them honor and uh, treating them as uh, gifts from God. And so that's how, ideally how it works. Of course, we're sinners and we mess it all up, but ideally that's how it ought to work. And so we see this kind of authority and it, it should work beautifully, it should work amazingly, but we mess it up because we're sinners. Now, it doesn't mean that that uh, structure is wrong. It's very good. We see that even in, you know, the psychological studies that they've done. So we have this idea here where that's how it should be. That's how it works best. Then we come to the idea of civil authorities. Now, throughout the world, there are governing authorities. Paul states in Romans 13 that there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Whoever resists the governing authority resists what God has appointed. So God has set up governments and rulers around the world. They're to carry out judgment on those who do wrong. And this way they act as ministers or deacons is the word of God 
as they act as avengers and carry out God's wrath on wrongdoers. To avoid God's wrath and for the sake of conscience, Christians are to voluntarily submit themselves to these authorities. We talked about this before. Ultimately, uh, the authorities are, you know, uh, they are put in place by God and should serve God. Now, if they force you to do something that is against God, then we have the right to disobey because God is in charge. So what does Paul say here? He says, first thing that uh, we are to be towards our government is to be obedient. And that obedient word means persuaded by who comes first. So this is literally what the word means. Some translations say obey the magistrates, which makes the meaning of the word a little more obvious here. So just obey is kind of, um, well, it's pretty ambiguous, you know. But it has more to do with obeying whoever comes first. It's not talking about obeying in general, but about obeying the civil authorities or magistrates that are over us. A Christian voluntarily submitting to the authorities and not vying for their position then obeys the laws set down by those magistrates. So whatever they're commanding, then we follow. As long as, again, there's always the exception, if they're telling us to sin, then we can't. So, we always have that in place. Whenever you're talking about that, that is always there. Because we have to talk about authority, right? So Christ is the ultimate authority. He is the one we always answer to. If the authorities under him are obeying him and telling us to do things that are uh, not sinful, then we obey that. There's no reason for us not to. We don't just disobey just because they're not Christ. So That's interesting because if you take this back to the time of Titus and Crete, this is a necessary reminder for the Cretans. Remember who Paul's writing about. Remember who these people are. He said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. He's quoting from Epimenides. Their normal disposition would not lend itself to submission and obedience. That's not who these people were. The world knew the Cretans to be this way. And Christians on the island of Crete, submitting, obeying to the government, would be one of the ways that their testimony would shine brightly, because no one else was probably doing it. Also at this time in history, the world did not recognize the difference between Jews and Christians. At best, Christianity was a new sect of Judaism, if they saw a difference at all. The problem with that is that the view, uh, you know, the Roman Empire had of, of Jews. They were thought of as seditious people that were constantly rebellious. This view was not completely wrong, as the Jews did often cause uprisings and rebel. There was a whole sect of zealots that would seek to assassinate various leaders. So what Paul is commanding, actually commanding again, because he says to remind them, is that Christians are to obey the government and its laws, unlike most of the people that they probably knew, unlike most of the Gentiles they knew, unlike most of the Jewish people they knew. In this way, they would be the salt of the earth. They would be that light shining up, up, up on that hill that would, couldn't miss the city, you know? That city that's up there, you can't miss that city. So... That's the idea. If, if Christians are following uh, what the government says and not trying to be all seditious and everything and rebellious just for rebellion's sake, then that will, that will stand out. Next thing is he says that they need to be ready for every good work. So doing good helps to live without fear. Romans 13, 3-4 says, Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant. He is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So Christians are called to be and to do good in the civil arena. We're to care for the fatherless and the widow. We practice hospitality and charity. We follow the laws that our government has established. If our conduct is good and we are prepared for every good work, then we should have nothing to fear from the government. If we're breaking the law, rebellious or disrespectful to the authority over us, then we should expect the sword. 
It's fairly commonsensical. Now, preparing and doing good does not guarantee good outcomes. We cannot take Paul's idea in Romans 13 and go too far with it. He's stating a general principle, not a rule without exceptions. Paul is prepared to do good works, and yet his own life shows that he experienced persecution and the sword from the government. You can read some of his treatment by the government in Acts 23 through 25. This shows that if the authorities are acting as they should, and you are acting as you should, all will be well. But if you're doing evil, or the government is doing evil, then we have trouble. So, remember, doing good is according to Jesus, not according to ourselves. So remember, Jesus is the ultimate authority, and all lower authorities must answer to him. You cannot obey the government and disobey the Lord. When met with this choice, Peter and the apostles said, we must obey God rather than men. They flatly, they flat out denied the authorities who charged them not to teach in the name of Jesus. They, they had to. The authority, the higher authority said that you have to teach, you have to preach. So that's what they did. If we're met with the same choice, we must make the same decision. We must obey God above all. First, we must make sure we are not disobeying just for our own personal preferences or convenience. But if we're being forced to choose between sinning against God and conscience or following the authorities, we have no authority other than Christ. We must make that choice. We must obey God rather than men. So that's what it comes down to. Now, this takes careful examination. It takes wisdom. It takes thought. Because if we're going to disobey the civil government, we need to make sure that we are obeying Christ. Not just our own personal preferences. Not just because we don't want to. You know, Paul said, pay your taxes. <laughs> you may not want to. You may think it's, uh, you know, a lot of money that you're having to give but he said pay the taxes now they said if you got to go out and you got to you know the government is forcing you to turn over jews so that they might be exterminated well then you think okay is that what god would want mm, i don't think so you know vengeance is in the hands of god not in our own whims so you have to say, okay, you know, were those people in Nazi Germany or in other parts of the world, in Romania and places like that, that were hiding Jewish people, that were helping them? It, was that wrong for them to disobey the government? I would have to say no, because what they were doing is evil. And Christ is ultimately the one who is in charge. Ultimately, we must say we must obey God rather than men. So that's our study for today. Now, tomorrow we'll take a look at how to act towards our neighbors outside of the church. We talked about in church. We're going to talk about outside the church. So come back next time.